Welcome to Feedback Strategies for your online course. I am recording this workshop, so if any of you have to leave early, not to worry, I will send this out to you after our session today. I just wanted to give you a quick uh, look at what's on the agenda. So we're going to start just with a few icebreakers and getting to know everybody in the session. And then we're going to start with looking at different types of feedback. There are some different forms that we can consider. We're going to look at some plans for communication with your students. This is particularly beneficial for anybody who is teaching online or if you have a strong online component to your course. Um, and then as far as discussing strategies that goes hand in hand with best practices, some things that we can do in an online setting to, to help communicate with our students and provide feedback. And finally, because I know everybody is curious about this, what kind of tools are available? And so we're going to take a look at some options. So maybe you'll see some different techniques that maybe you have not considered or, or maybe some features within Blackboard um, that are new to you. We do have a final Q&A period at the end, uh, but it's a pretty small group. So feel free to chime in anytime you have questions or comments. Welcome, Jen. You just joined us. Um, perfect timing. We're just going to start with some introductions. So if you wouldn't mind, uh, if you can go ahead and click on the text chat. Again, it's the, the little purple thumbprint down at the bottom right corner of your screen. Um, and then click on the little chat bubble. Uh, but just introduce yourself. Let us know your name. What do you teach? Uh, and then I'm curious uh, to put yourself back in the student perspective for just a moment here. What is the most memorable piece of feedback you received as a student? Um, and why does it stand out? So I'll let you type for a few moments. Great. Welcome, Chan. I know I'm putting everybody on the spot a little bit with that last question there. Let's see. Natalie, that's really interesting. The most memorable moment was uh, when the doctoral advisor put the paper up on a large screen and went through it line by line and edited the entire document. Painful, but you learned a lot. Jim says the most important feedback uh, was learning to synthesize and extend content in the paper rather than summarizing and regurgitating things. It stuck with you into writing research papers today. Excellent. Remember some very specific feedback. You're looking at this assignment differently from what I asked for, and I like this. Nice. Excellent. It sounds like there's some positive memories here, so this is good. Um, I promise we'll, we'll take a look at this um, a little bit more. So. All right, if you're still typing, please go ahead. Otherwise, I think we're going to hop into our next slide here. I just wanted to start off with just a couple of different types of feedback. So there are three primary types of feedback. And the first one I think is probably um, the first one that comes to mind for most of us. It's this idea of instructor feedback. Right? As you go about structuring your course, you're thinking about ways that you're going to interact and engage with your student. How are you going to give them commentary or constructive criticism, 
right? That's the instructor feedback. But there are other types of feedback that are equally important to your students. Um, and I say this because I, I also want to try to help make your workload manageable as an instructor. So don't underestimate these other two types of feedback. There is also the idea of peer feedback, where students are commenting on their peers' work, um, and they are also providing constructive criticism. They're asked to uh, think of ways that they could help somebody. Uh, what kind of feedback can I give you that would improve your work? And there's also the idea of student feedback, and that's the feedback that they give you. As, and so as an instructor, you can tailor your lesson plan to better meet their needs. Uh, so that's also something that we want to take a look at today. So we do want to talk about how do we plan for these different types of feedback. So we, we need to have this uh, kind of embedded into our into our syllabus, into our lesson plan, uh, into our approach as we interact with our students online. So I, I do have this little comic strip up for you. I'll let you take a look at this for a moment. All right, so I do think it's kind of funny, uh, but I do think there is still this kernel of truth here that maybe we should unpack a little bit. The student is being told by their instructor that you need to have this done as soon as possible, um, which in translation means like you should have done it yesterday. Um, but then from the student perspective, it, it looks a little bit different. If, they, if an instructor says, oh, I'll review your paper as soon as possible, the translation here is that I'll get it done sometime this century. Um, hopefully that's not actually the case with your courses. The idea here is that if we have communication guidelines as well as deadlines for our students, uh, we should probably also go about setting some of those goals for ourselves. A little bit of reciprocity here for our students. With that being said, when you're an online instructor, um, you do need to actually kind of set some of these boundaries and clearly establish them. You are not on call all the time. Just because we have mobile devices at our fingertips you know, 24 hours a day, that doesn't mean that you have to respond um, to your students immediately. So uh, this is a sample statement that you could use potentially for your syllabus, um, and it will help define these guidelines for, for feedback with your students when they can expect to hear a response from you. So again, you could say, please allow 24 hours for me to respond um, to your email. I cannot guarantee to reply on weekends. Send me your most pressing concerns by Friday. I typically do not respond to emails after 5 o'clock p.m. Um, also, you could use this uh, bottom half of this slide here, even underneath a signature line um, in your email. So you could just say, I know that we have different schedules. Um, email me anytime that, that works for you, um, but just be aware that I will respond um, in the hours listed above. So this is really beneficial for your students, um, particularly if you have somebody who's in a different time zone, if they're working the night shift, or, or who knows what's going on with your students. So um, just setting up some of these guidelines right away is a big stress relief. Communicating that timeline, again, all assignments um, are due by Sunday at 11.59 p.m. or grades will be updated and posted within three business days. Um, something to that effect is, is really beneficial for your students. Um, also, you can think about it too. Uh, when do your students typically uh, respond to you? When do they reach out when they have a problem? In my experience, a lot of times uh, it'll be right before something is due. You know, students need a, a certain amount of time in which to turn in their work. Um, unfortunately, when they go to submit something, that's oftentimes when they realize that they have a problem, whether it's a technical difficulty or um, they have some questions. So another strategy that you may consider using as an instructor is having your classes um, actually officially end for instead of Sunday at 11.59 p.m., you might want to do on Monday by 11.59 p.m. Uh, that way, if you 
keep a Monday through Friday schedule, you'll be um, available on Mondays to assist your students. So um, that's another possibility here. But um, whatever you choose, it's just about communicating your timeline clearly so um, you can help kind of regulate your schedule. So going back to those different types of feedback, right? It's not just the feedback that you are giving your students. It's all about um, getting feedback from your students as well, asking them some things. You know, what's working? What isn't working? You can distribute a survey. Technically, in Blackboard Ultra, they don't have the survey feature yet, but you could create a quiz and make it worth zero points, or you could also use Qualtrics. But periodically distributing surveys throughout your course will help you better assess where your students are at. If they understand the material, if they have questions, um, if they're worried about the structure of the course, anything like that. So um, make sure that you're checking in with them fairly routinely. So now I have a question for all of you. It's really not a right or wrong answer, but we're just looking at possibilities for, for different strategies. Um, how often do you ask students to do peer reviews or to critique their, their peers' work? And advantages or disadvantages? What do you, what do you think about the peer review process? Great. Lynn says, I see discussion boards as being part of this. Absolutely. And do they work well for you? Um, do you think there's room for improvement? What, what are your thoughts on this? Natalie gives the undergraduates, um, oh, I see, undergraduates just give generic help, like nice work on this. Huh. So it doesn't sound very constructive. Interesting. There can be pros and cons to peer review activities. Some instructors feel that there's an opportunity here for misinformation to get generated. So um, you, you do kind of have to keep kind of close regulation on it. Um, but again, it does take some of the pressure off of you and having to to review every single student uh, activity. Great, Bill teaches music. And so he says very often, um, that's always part of music because music is subjective and it's good to get lots of ideas. Great. Great, and Lynn says, those who get the most out of the session boards are early with their participation. Um, those who struggle might be waiting more towards the last minute, um, and they tend to post comments like me too in their remarks. All right. I might have an idea for this coming up. So we, we do want to talk about strategies. So um, let's take a look at some of these. One way to get some feedback from your students is to call for self-reflection. You're going to have to ask them a series of open-ended questions, nothing with a yes, no. Um, you can ask them to analyze a rubric and the assignment prompt. So uh, this is a great way to, to get students involved in the, the process here. Um, and another idea is self-grading. So if you've never tried this, uh, this is something that I, I highly recommend. It can be very eye-opening for the students and also for you just to, to gauge uh, where your students are at in the process. Um, Something that you can do is you could find a sample of student work, and it could be something maybe that an actual student submitted in a previous semester, um, but just chop off their name, keep it anonymous, and ask your students to grade it. They have to assign um, a grade, and make sure they actually write it down. I usually ask students to do this first as an individual. Don't, don't let them talk with other students. Um, but ask them to grade the assignment. Is it an A? Is it a B? Is it a C? Is it a, is it a B plus? Um, but ask them to, to actually assign a grade to some sort of piece of work. And then after that, 
ask your students to divide up into groups. And as a group, they have to come together and agree upon um, a grade. What was it? Was it an A? Was it a B? Um, and presumably, some of these students are going to have to negotiate. They're going to have to now, as a group, come up with a, a grade. Um, and it's going to be different than what they came up with as an individual. Um, so it's a really good exercise in getting students to talk about you know, what, what kind of components go into their, their grading and you know, what, what did they arrive at? You know, were they using the rubric? Did they use the assignment prompt? Um, what kind of commentary would they have provided? So um, if you can ask students to step out of the role of just being maybe even a student or, or feeling like they're a passenger in the grading process, but asking them to get involved, you know, you might kind of open their eyes to, to their expectations. So um, it's kind of working backwards. So instead of just having them submit an assignment, um, now ask them to look at one that's already been graded. So if you have an opportunity, I highly recommend this. Another idea here is exit slips. I use the word exit loosely. Um, this is not something that you necessarily have to assign at the end of class. It can also look different if you have an online course that is completely asynchronous. Um, but it's this idea that students are required to periodically check in with you, um, and they have to answer at least one of these questions. So like, what did you learn? What was confusing? what don't you understand, I still have a question about, or what else do you want me to know? Um, I've seen this administered in different ways. You could ask students to submit this anonymously. Sometimes the benefit in doing so is that students are going to be more receptive to opening up to you and admitting when they're confused. Other times, Instructors may use this as double duty. Um, they could ask you to put your name on the exit slip, and then it also is a way of tracking attendance. So there's different ways that you can try it out. Um, if you've never tried it, you could experiment and see which one produces better results. Um, but again, it is this idea that students actually have to respond to you about a specific lesson plan or a specific unit of the course. So here we again have the utilize the peer review. Um, this is something that's kind of interesting in Blackboard Ultra, and, and I do have another slide later on um, that talks a little bit more about how you actually set this up. Um, but the peer review process now is actually something that is built into Blackboard. It is anonymous from the student perspective. So you can see it as the teacher. You, you know who wrote the original submission and you know who provided what commentary. So you can assure students that you can see all of this. You're keeping, you're keeping close tabs on their participation. But again, from the student perspective, it's anonymous. So they won't know which of their peers uh, reviewed their project. It does give you two different due dates on here. So there's the first um, assessment due date and that's when the first original student submission comes in. And then there is also the uh, peer review due date. So how long do peer reviewers have to actually read the, the student writing and to provide commentary or feedback? And the instructor also gets to choose um, the number of reviews. So you can really pick any number. I think um, in this picture, I have three. Right. So if I turn in my homework, three people are going to give me their, their feedback. And the way that this is set up in Blackboard Ultra is that you have to participate um, in the first initial assessment due date. Um, so if you didn't turn something in, then you're not going to be selected to, to review somebody else's work. Just in case you've never seen this tool, um, that is the way that it's set up. All right, so now I'm going to turn the tables here in just a moment. I'm going to ask some questions for, for you, um, but let's talk about some of these best practices. I call it the feedback sandwich. Um, it goes by many different names, but there are some ways in which you can provide that instructor feedback. 
And so they've really given it three different components. They want evidence, they want to keep it balanced, um, and they want to make sure that it's measurable. So as far as evidence goes, when you are providing feedback to your students, you want to point out very specific parts of their, their work that you're interested in. Um, you want to relate it maybe to other material. If you say something is vague, maybe you can point to something where you saw that it was very specific and, and you'd like them to really emulate that style more. Um, so again, think about as much evidence as possible you can point your students to so that they know uh, what you are looking for. As far as balance goes, um, you always want to make sure to include a little bit of positivity in there to uh, interject with that. Sometimes I think as instructors, we're so focused on helping our students grow and expand and learn um, that we also forget to point out what students are really doing well. Um, and, and that needs to be in there. If somebody really nailed this concept of organization, you want to point that out so that in future projects, they'll remember that and say, oh yeah, that, that was my strong point. I should do that again. Um, so not just things that they can improve upon, but also um, things that you would like to see them repeat. So. Um, Make sure you've got that positive um, interjection in there. And then measurable. This can be difficult, but um, students want to know how and why they're being graded. They want to feel like there is some actual context uh, that they can look at. So try to make it uh, measurable. If something did not meet your standards, why? Um, what is that specific scale? So they're looking for as much evidence as possible here. And it can be tricky, but that is our, our feedback sandwich. And we're going to take a look at a, a couple of comments here. Actually, I think I moved that slide. We'll come back to that one. All right. There is also a federal requirement for online courses. So again, it's not just best practice. It is actual policy for regular and substantive interaction. So there are three different characteristics of it, um, and I will be sending you the link to this website. Um, there's a lot of helpful resources provided by NIU um, and specific examples. But there are three main components of this regular and substantive interaction policy, which goes hand in hand with providing feedback for our students. So this interaction needs to be initiated by the instructor. It must be frequent and consistent. Right? So students need to know when this type of interaction is going to take place. So again, it kind of goes back to this idea that it's scheduled. And of course, the interaction needs to be focused uh, very specifically on the course subject. All right, so I'm going to actually turn this over to you. Uh, I have three different scenarios here, and you can chime in. You vote in the text chat, or if you prefer the microphone, you can do that too. Uh, but let's take a look at three different scenarios here. So the first one is in each week or unit of your course, you include a required discussion forum. You supply feedback and commentary, but you do not respond to every student post. This is an example of meeting the regular and substantive interaction policy. True or false? See one vote. Anybody else? And Natalie's mulling it over. All right. I don't think so. All right. One for true, one for false. And Jaffe says no. Let's go back. Let's take a look. 
three components. Is the commentary initiated by the instructor? I would say yes. Frequent and consistent. I would also say yes, as long as they participate um, in every every unit, and students can expect to see their instructor commentary. I would say yes. Bill and Lynn are in agreement. All right. Focus on the course subject. Presumably yes. So yes, it does meet the regular and substantive interaction policy. The regular and substantive interaction policy does not have um, a mandate on it that you need to reply to every single post for your students. And I think this again comes back to the idea that we want to promote interaction between students. They, they are the ones who are really the, the main contributors to this discussion forum. Um, and also realistically, if we have really large classes, um, I, I think it would not be feasible to expect one instructor to respond maybe to 100 students. Natalie says, let's say a student's post is skipped every week, may never get feedback from you. How do you manage that? Uh, presumably at some point in this class, they're going to get feedback from you um, and at least one of their posts. And when we talk about regular and substantive interaction, it has to happen on more than one level. So the discussion forum is not the only way that your students are getting responses from you. But that's a great question. All right, let's try our second one. You host open office hours virtually every week. Students can drop in with questions or concerns. This is an example of meeting the regular and substantive interaction policy. True or false? See one that says yes, one that says no. It's tricky, isn't it? And by the way, I do want to emphasize that this is the federal regulations as well. So this is not just an IU's interpretation. Um, this is why I bring this up. All right, Lynn said no, because they are not required. I would agree with Lynn. Um, it is wonderful to host open office hours, but if they are not required, um, then that means that there could be quite a few students who, who never attend. Um, and again, it has to be initiated by the instructor. So um, if they are not prompted to attend, um, no, it does not fall under the regular and substantive interaction policy. Still a wonderful idea. I, I very much encourage open office hours, but um, they, so this is not part of the policy. All right, last one. Your students are asked to read several articles um, and assigned passages of the textbook. You supply a list of questions that students should keep in mind while synthesizing the required reading material. This is an example of meeting regular and substantive interaction. True or false. I do see here in the chat, Lynn, uh, for one course, uh, she requires office hours two times over the semester. That's fantastic. That is a great way to, to kind of reinvent the wheel on this open um, office hour um, policy. 
knowing that your students do have to come in two times during the, the semester, but still allowing some of that scheduling flexibility where they can sign up to meet you, uh, then you know, that would actually meet the regular and substantive interaction policy requirements. This may surprise you, but for question number three, they said this actually does meet the regular and substantive interaction policy requirement. Um, not just telling your students to go and read a passage, but to follow up with them and to provide commentary um, actually does help them meet this regular and substantive interaction uh, requirement. Students are, are hearing from you, you're providing guidance and support, uh, as well as pointers for what to do with the material. So um, another way to think about this too is uh, a great way to help meet regular and substantive interaction policies is uh, maybe even just to send out weekly uh, announcements. Students can anticipate hearing from you about the course, uh, what they're going to be doing that week, maybe reminders for deadlines or assignments. Um, so a lot of these things that you're already doing may meet this um, policy. Okay, so we're gonna go back to, to grading here. I think I mixed up some of my slides here, so apologies for jumping around a little bit. But we can go back to uh, this idea of instructor feedback and of course, providing commentary. I think that's honestly what most of us think about when we think about feedback. So one idea here is minimal marking. It's the idea that you're not going to fill the margins with loads and loads of commentary. I had one instructor who swore that every time, and again, this is before online submission for, for all assignments, but when he would hand back essays to students, he would watch them and, and no matter what he did and how many comments he, he tried to supply, the first thing that students always did is they went straight to the back page to check on their, their grade. So um, knowing this, he was prompted into making sure that he did minimal marking because students didn't always read as thoroughly through uh, the commentary as he thought they should have. But there are some benefits that go with it. You can avoid auto-correcting. So a great way to go about minimal marking is, for instance, if you see maybe a common theme or a common error, you might circle one or you might even fix one, but then you can ask the student to identify the other three errors that they made of a similar nature. Um, so this is asking students to, to go back in there and, and to make the corrections themselves. It does help you save time. So one thing that we want to be cognizant of when we're providing feedback to students is we're trying to roughly be consistent. Uh, we want to spend roughly the same amount of time grading our, our, all of our students. So you don't want to spend too much time on any one given student, and so this can help you with that. It also does focus on future improvement. So a good rule of thumb here is to only comment on things where students are going to have an opportunity to practice or revise. So if you had students critique an argument, you know, if they have another opportunity coming up in a different assignment to you know, synthesize an argument, to evaluate it, um, that might be a good opportunity to comment on that. If they're gonna use this skill again, you're definitely going to want to maybe focus on those areas. But if this is something that they are not going to be practicing in, in future assignments, um, then you may not want to, to comment on it because for a student that could be very discouraging knowing that they're supposed to, to improve in one certain area, but then never getting a chance to practice those skills. Um, so try to think about it. Where, where can your students continue to improve? And of course, again, going back to this last idea here is just inviting your students to, to revise. Um, your feedback is supposed to incentivize them. So again, it is a little bit about strategy here. So how frequently can your students expect to hear from you? Um, this should be outlined uh, pretty early on in your course and maybe even uh, reiterated in your in your syllabus or on your assignment prompt or in the discussion board. Prioritize the urgency. Uh, 
Um, sometimes I think we can get a little overkill with uh, the amount of feedback that we give students. Um, think about how many announcements you're sending out per week. Um, and then think about how many other courses your students are enrolled in. So um, really think about what things do you really want them to prioritize. Um, and, and that's where I would focus your attention. And then of course the timing. So your students need to do something with your feedback. So, so you have to think about when are they going to receive that feedback? Um, and then what's the turnaround time for them to practice those skills? All right, so this is actually the one that I, I meant to lead with. Um, but on this slide here, these are some actual types of feedback that we could get, say, from an instructor. So um, Tracy Miller here is the instructor. I'm curious what you think about Tracy's feedback. Um, we can even rate it maybe on a scale of one to five, you know, one being not so good, five being optimal. Um, her first piece of feedback here is please provide more detail. How do you feel about that? Natalie doesn't love it. Excellent. Anyone else want to cast a vote? Remember, a lot of this is subject to interpretation. I think I'm probably somewhere with Natalie on this one. I, I don't hate it. I don't love it. Um, I guess on a scale of one to five, it's like a solid three for me. Please provide more detail. Okay. But again, detail about what? Um, what are the specific areas that they can improve? Um, examples of those details. Um, something that would clue me in as a student if I missed the detail in the first place. Um, where am I going to? Where am I going to see an example of that so, so I know what to include? Yeah. There's a second one here. So again, Tracy, our instructor said, what do you think the goals were? And this was in relation to goals and objectives should not be assumed as given. They may not relate to the true goals of the program. Uh, they should be evaluated along with the rest of the program. No. Thoughts on this? Anyone want to rank it on a scale of one to five? Lynn likes the comment. Natalie has some questions. Um, I wonder, does the student have to outline what they knew about the goals? I think they're reporting adequately here. I think it's pretty decent feedback. I like that there's a question here. Uh, a feedback statement doesn't just have to be a statement. It can be an open-ended question that invites students to think, um, to answer to apply their skills critically. 
There is always room for improvement. Um, I noticed that neither of these comments included any any type of positive feedback for the student. Um, if I was a student, I wouldn't know what I had done well here. So, you know, I think there is still some room for improvement, but um, on the whole, it's not bad. Okay. So now we've got about 15 minutes left, so I think we've got time to look at some specific tools that are unique to online courses. So the first part here is Blackboard Annotate for customizable feedback. This is uh, really helpful, particularly if you're trying to be time conscious when grading and providing feedback on large assessments. So you can use a rubric as well. Um, but part of the, the nice thing here with Blackboard Annotate is that you can open up a variety of different files that your students submit. So it could be, I think, even PowerPoints, it could be PDFs, it could be Word documents, it could be images. Um, and so when you use Blackboard Annotate, you've got some different tools available to you. You can use arrows to draw, you can circle, um, you, can, you can almost, um, you know, basically draw on the margins like you would on an actual piece of paper. You can highlight text, um, but then there's also this idea of the content library. And so this is a nice place where you can reuse some commentary. Now, I know you might be thinking, well, I'd like to provide personalized commentary for my students, and absolutely you should do that. Um, but presumably your students are going to be graded on a set of criteria. So if you are working on terminology or thesis statements or something of that nature, you may find that there are certain topics that keep coming up over and over again. So you can save your comment and you can reuse it. So this is going to be really a nice time saver and it does provide a layer of consistency as you grade across the entire course. Has anybody ever used uh, Blackboard Annotate for this? Have they used the content library and saved their their well, if you do, let me know what you think about it. There's also the grading rubrics, which do look a little bit different in Ultra, so I wanted to make sure that I showed you what these look like. Uh, so once you create a rubric, you can save it and reuse it, which is really nice. So if you have a generic rubric that you're going to use for all um, homework assignments or all discussion boards or all journal prompts, um, you can reuse it. You don't have to recreate it every single time. Um, and what it does is when you go to the grade book, you'll um, see all of these different little categories. You can see my red arrows going down the side. Um, when you click on the arrow, it's going to ask you to fill in the rubric, um, and then it automatically updates the score for the students. Excellent. I, I see some tips coming in here on the, the text chat. Um, one thing that I do want to note with grading rubrics is that they currently do not work with assessments containing questions. So um, these are really ideal for either um, homework assignments where students, you know, attach a file or like a, a journal submission. But if you have like, any type of multiple choice question or anything like that, then the rubrics do not attach. But more features are to come. So, uh, but that is a nice feature that we have there. Um, the other one that I really like is the audio and video feedback. So I don't know if any of you have seen this or not. Um, when it was initially rolled out, I think there was a, a few hiccups with it, but it seems to be working well. So if you go to the grade book, um, and I tried to highlight here in yellow where you can find this, um, on the right-hand side where it asks for feedback, you can, um, Click the little plus icon and then it'll tell you to start recording. So recording has um, really two features. It has the webcam, which you can turn on or off, um, but then it also has your microphone. And so it's not just about giving students text comments. Um, as soon as they go to their, uh, to view their grade, they'll just click on it and they'll see a little video recording um, and they can hear your voice. So 
this could be another uh, kind of game changer for you. And also, it, it is really a nice way to customize these online courses to kind of bring in some of that humanity. Your students can see you or they can hear your voice. Um, the recordings, I believe, are limited to five minutes each per student, which I think many of you would find uh, to be more than enough time. We can talk much faster than we than we type. That's another way just to provide feedback to your students. Uh, this is actually one of my, my favorite features of Ultra, and, and I'm not paid to, to promote Ultra. I just happen to really like this feature. It's not available in original. So if you ever do group assignments for students, you now have two levels here for uh, grading and feedback. You can provide feedback for the entire group. And so everybody, when they go to check their grades, will be able to see it. But you also have an option here to um, go ahead and submit commentary to the individual, which is really nice. You know, if somebody did an outstanding job, you can tell them that, you know, and it'll only go to that one person. So um, I really like having that ability to toggle back and forth between group and individual feedback. Similarly, you can adjust individual scores. Um, so as you can see here, this is um, kind of a wild assignment. Here I was with Winston Churchill, Sean Connery, um, Leonardo da Vinci, um, but the Megan Holt preview user, she did an exceptional job here. And so uh, she was able to get 95 out of the 100 points possible versus everybody else in her group, um, they received 75%. So again, it is this um, ability that you have as an instructor. You can, you can look at students uh, kind of as a group, or you can kind of narrow down that scope and, and you can go in at the individual level. So a lot of customization here. You also have the automated feedback which is really nice, um, particularly if you have smaller quizzes, uh, things of that nature. And again, you're providing feedback to your students. Now, maybe my example on the screen is not the best. Um, I'm sure your college questions are going to be far more difficult than um, choosing the best color. But again, it's not just yes or no. Um, if somebody got a wrong answer, you can give them a hint. You can prompt them where to go to find that correct answer. So um, again, you can provide feedback for your students um, in kind of an automated fashion. So hopefully this will be another time saver for you as the instructor. And of course, here's the peer review, um, which again, I wanted to show you a little bit more. Yes, Natalie, go ahead. The last question you or slide you had about automated feedback, I was wondering if you know, this is a, and maybe it's in a future slide, and this is on the spot. Um, when there's an essay question, the, there is no automated feedback. And so what it says is example of, you know, acceptable answer. So my question is, do the students see that as like, hey, this is a prompt for you. This is an example of what I'm looking for. Or is that where I would put the answer? And when they are done, if they didn't get a point on that, that would be considered automated feedback. Do you have any insight on that? Um, I think it's um, like an example, like a hint, but um, you know what, we've got some time. So after this, I can double check and just make sure I'll, I'll go to my sandbox so I don't give you um, a wrong answer. But I feel like it's a hint as opposed to yeah. like this is the correct answer. It appears like a hint, but I was like, oh man, like I'd love to be able to just have that automated for them, just like every other question, you know, like that we have that option. Sure. Like you said, right here, think of water, blue. Um, don't forget, like page 17 says to do this. That's what I was hopeful to put in my automated feedback for essays. I just don't currently see that. I think you're right that it's a hint, but man, that would be a nice, you know, next time they do an upgrade on Blackboard for quizzes, that would be something to help us. Well, and one of the things that I can do is since I'm sending you the recording of today's session, I am also going to send you a couple of resources. Um, Blackboard wants to hear from instructors. Um, and so there's a, um, a submission inbox just for um, suggested updates. So. Um, you can create that and say, hey, I really want to be able to have some type of automated feedback for an essay question. Um, and other instructors can upvote you and they can say, yeah, we want that too. 
So I will at least send you that so we can, you know, request that as a, a new feature. But I will double check in my sandbox, but I'm almost certain it's a hint as opposed to automated feedback. Um, okay, so yes, here's the peer review, which I know I showed earlier, um, but again, some people haven't seen this. Like, well, where is it located? So anytime um, you have an assignment in Blackboard Ultra, if you click the little gear icon, um, this is where it's at. It'll show up under you know, how many points the assignment is worth. You, you check the box for peer review, and then you click the little blue link that says select peer settings. Um, and so this is, a, again, another way for students to get feedback on their work. Um, and again, as the instructor, you get to, to carefully regulate it. You can go in there at any time and see who submitted what comment. So you know, if you're ever fearful that they're going to get off track, um, this is a great way for you to keep an eye on them. So OK, Q&A, other than, other than Natalie's question, which we can go to next. Peer review and ultra, do they see this before I sign off on it? Um, I think it automatically posts um, based on the due date. So if we go, I think that's, if I'm understanding your question correctly. So like the peer review date, if I said it was due this Friday by 11.59 PM, uh, it will automatically post. Um, so, you know, you may want to get in there and just double check their work before it posts. but you'll still have an opportunity to, to review it. Yeah, if you want to go in there um, and remove comments or scores, you can do so at any time. Um, and part of this, again, we'll go back to those settings. So let me... Um, 